Audiobooks Presence Title, Sheriff Larrabee's Prisoner Date of First Publication, 1921 Author, Frederick Schiller Faust, as Martin Dexter, 1892-1944 Sheriff Larrabee's Prisoner Note, when this short novel first appeared in the December 3, 1921 issue of Western Story magazine, the editor assigned Frederick Faust a new pseudonym for the story, Martin Dexter, but this would be the only time this name would be used as a Faust byline. Faust used other byline names at this time, David Manning, George Owen Baxter, and Max Brand. These multiple identities were intended to make the readers think that each one was a different and distinct author. Chapter 1 No Hangout The rain had been falling steadily, with a northwester to drive it aslant. Now the wind leaped suddenly at Jack Montaigne, and as if its former pace had been maintained only to lure him into a false security, it now drove the rain in level volleys that crashed against his slicker and stung his face. Even his weather-hardened hands resented the fury of the storm. The blast stopped the trot of his pony that remained for the moment leaning into the storm. Presently it again gathered headway, urged on by the tickling spur of the rider. When the anger of the wind and rain had spent itself, Montaigne screened his eyes and peered anxiously up the valley. It was then he made out the two lights one a mere yellow ray which, passing through the mist of rain, was split into a thousand shivering portions as Montaigne squinted at it, and the other merely a dim red blur. They were welcome sights to the rider on this black night, and yet he hesitated before going straight toward them. Eventually he decided that the news about him could not have preceded him to this desolate valley, and he touched the pony with the spurs again. This time the weary beast broke into a lope, cupping the muddy water on the trail in the hollows of his forehoofs, and sending it up in spurts and showers to drench the rider. But against such physical discomforts Jack Montaigne was proof. When the possessions of a man have shrunk to his bridle and saddle and horse and the old gun, sagging at his hip, when, moreover, fear and dread ride at his side, the elements are negligible factors. In truth, the storm fitted in with the mood of Montaigne, and his temper rose in fierce bursts of revolt against the world, just as the wind occasionally struck at him with redoubled force, and like the night his mind was filled with a steady, black gloom. The red light on his right now grew rapidly. The rain streaked down against it, and above the light he made out the outlines of a tree. Someone was sitting by a campfire to the lee of a tree, and that was his only shelter against this furious storm. There was no other conclusion to come to, and Montaigne shook his head in wonder. Perhaps the fellow had not seen that light down the road, that light which evidently came from a house. It was partly with a kindly determination to tell the camper that there was a better shelter in sight, and partly with the hope of learning a little about this valley in which he found himself, that Montaigne turned to the right and came squarely upon the fire. It was a miserable and uncertain blaze, fizzing and hissing constantly, as drops of water filtered down from the boughs of the tree above. And yet the broad trunk made a rather good shelter, for the steady wind kept driving the rain at an angle, and the man, whose back was against the tree, was in no danger of getting wet by the direct fall of water. Only the drops, that trickled through the foliage above, came splashing about him. He had been stirring weakly at the fire, and it was not until the pony came within a yard of the blaze, snorting in disgust as the smoke filled its nostrils, that the camper lifted to the view of Montaigne white, rat-like face, 
out of which little bright black eyes glittered. Get your own fire, Bo, said the camper, without waiting to learn definitely the purpose of the new arrival. I ain't got any more and enough room for myself, and I ain't going to let you in. Get on your way and hustle your own fire. He enforced this suggestion with an ugly lifting of his upper lip, very much after the manner of a terrier guarding a bone. But Jack Montaigne did not immediately answer. He waited until his observations had taken in all the details of the battered hat, the coat of nameless age and patches, the shoes through the ends of which the toes were thrusting, and the whole atmosphere of unclean suspicion that dwelt about the tramp like a garment. You dirty rat, said Jack Montaigne, when he broke silence. I ought to twist your neck into two pieces. What? demanded the tramp, starting, as he shaded his eyes with his hands and peered half viciously and half curiously up through the darkness, as if he wished with all his heart to attack the man who had insulted him, but must first make sure that such an attack would be an expedient proceeding. That which he saw was apparently extremely discouraging, for he settled back against the tree and changed his open defiance to a sullen scowl. But, went on Jack Montaigne, smiling in spite of himself at this change of front, I'm going to do you a good turn, instead of kicking you away from that fire and out into the mud. I'm going to tell you that there is a house down the road about a mile. You don't have to stay here. You can go down there and sleep in the barn, anyway. Can I? asked the tramp. All right, you go and try it. That's all I got to say. You go and try it. He wrapped his arms about him, shivering, as the wind grew fresher out of the north, and he grinned in mockery at the rider. Did you try it? asked the rider, with a sudden sternness that was not, however, directed at the tramp. Did you try it and get turned out into a night like this? Maybe, replied the tramp. The rider set his teeth in one of those convulsions of anger which seemed to be characteristic, and the tramp, peering at him by the dim firelight, shrank from what he saw. But are there no other houses around here? asked Montaigne. Find out for yourself, said the tramp. He had been emboldened by the generous indignation of the night rider, as if this were proof that the larger man would not take advantage of his superior size, or the revolver that was faintly outlined under the skirt of his slicker. Find out for yourself, that's what I had to do. Jack Montaigne considered that lean, pointed face with a thoughtful contempt. No, he decided at length, I won't look any farther. I'll go to that house yonder, and I'll get supper and a bed there, whether they want to give it to me or not. If they turn even a dog out into this sort of weather, they don't deserve no consideration, and I ain't going to give it to em. If you want to come along with me, I'll see that they put you up, too. But the tramp merely laughed. I ain't a fool, he declared. I ain't going to walk that far for nothing. Besides, I'm doing fine right here. As long, then, said Montaigne. The tramp returned no answer, but he followed the stranger with a bright glance of his little eyes, as Montaigne swerved out into the storm again. Through the crashing of the rain Jack kept steadily for the house. Presently he saw the light in the window grow brighter, and he made out the shadowy form of a big ranch house, one of those long and ragged roof lines that attest many additions built onto the original and central structure. Turn a stranger away from such a place, where there must be room to put up twenty extra men. 
his anger grew with every stride of his pony, when at length he drew rein, his jaw was set. It was the rear of the house he had approached, and the light came from a projecting wing that was evidently the kitchen. As Montaigne swung out of the saddle, he stepped from the blast of the storm into the quiet shelter of the building. Pausing at the door, he heard two voices, both raised one the harsh voice of a woman, and one a man's voice. If he don't get the money out of that chest, said the man, where does he get it? Anyway, I'm going to find out if... Shut up, exclaimed the woman. Let me tell you. Here she lowered her voice until it became unintelligible to Montaigne, and he rapped heavily on the door. The voices ceased, then there was a shuffling of feet, the turning of the doorknob, as someone called out to him, Who's there? It was the same growling voice of the man whom he had heard speaking inside the kitchen. A stranger, partner, said Montaigne pleasantly, held up in this rain, and I'd like to get a place to sleep and a bite to eat. This ain't no hangout for bums, answered the other fiercely. Get out and stay out. And the door was slammed in the face of Montaigne. But in that moment he flung himself forward, leaning low, his shoulder and its cushion of hardened muscle presented for the shock, after the fashion of a football player. The door had been slammed, but the latch had not yet clicked home, and the lunging body of Montaigne knocked the door wide. The burly fellow was sent spinning across the floor of the kitchen and crashed into the wall, and Montaigne, crouched low and staggering, entered. When he straightened himself, he saw the man of the house scrambling to his feet, uttering a profusion of terrific curses. Then the big-shouldered, loose-jointed fellow sprang to the wall and caught a shotgun off the nails where it was supported. He did not, however, level the gun at Montaigne. Something in the face of the stranger arrested the motion. His close set, bulging eyes dwelt in a sort of daze on the newcomer, and Montaigne thought he had never seen features so animal-like, save in the woman. She also had reached for the nearest weapon, sweeping up a great butcher knife in her work-reddened hand, but, like her son the relationship was proclaimed in their faces her motion to strike was arrested. For they saw in the newcomer a man well over middle height, so strong and sinewy that even the loose flapping folds of the slicker could not entirely disguise his power. More than this, he was in a tremendous passion which his silence made more terrible than a profusion of curses. In relaxation he must have been a handsome man, but now his features expressed nothing but consuming rage. His brows were black above his glaring eyes, his nostrils quivered, his mouth was a straight, white-edged line, and the tendons of his neck stood forth. Moreover, point was given to his anger by the fact that his right hand was under his slicker. Beyond a doubt it was grasping the butt of a revolver.